This is the ExtraTime.com Monday podcast. I'm Oshin Langan. Hope you're keeping safe and well. So we all like Formula 1 again, apparently. I haven't followed it since the days of Jordan. Uh, Eddie Jordan, not Jordan, the model Katie Price. Max Verstappen is the champion. He won it in dramatic circumstances. If you haven't heard about it by now, then you're not interested. So I don't have to go into the detail. But what we do know is, is that this isn't over yet, possibly. It could be settled by legal people, which I don't think any of us want to see. But look, Lewis Hamilton has been a great champion and may well be again in the future. But I wonder, can F1 kick on from here? And here's another thing. TV coverage grows your sport. Now, normally when I say that, I mean live TV coverage of your sport. But this whole Netflix Formula One drive to survive thing, it's no coincidence that that has happened over the last couple of years. Sorry, I just hit the table there. That has happened over the last couple of years. And now all of a sudden people are interested again. It's kind of created a connection between the sport and the people and now people want to watch the sport because of what they've seen on Netflix and there's definitely maybe a deeper dive into that that we could do in the next couple of weeks in the Premier League so much has happened since the weekend and as I talk to you it's only Monday you nearly forget what happened in the Premier League over the weekend Liverpool won Manchester United won Arsenal won Uh, Pierre um, Emmerich Aubameyang was cut from the squad for the game by the manager, which was interesting, wasn't it? He said it was a breach in discipline. We don't know what it is, but it's not great when your captain is breaching discipline. In League of Ireland news, um, Conan Byrne and Brendan Clark continuing their journey around the country, hitting crossbars in every League of Ireland ground. What a great job the guys have done. They've raised an awful lot of money for the Make-A-Wish Foundation. Please just Google Make-A-Wish and find where you can give donations and give some money if you possibly can. I know it's coming up to Christmas and... um, You know, there's a lot of things you can spend your money on. But if you have a spare couple of quid, please donate it to the lads there. As we speak on the way to the RSC, and hopefully I'll catch up with them and you'll see some uh, material on the extratime.com social media channels. Um, Speaking of League of Ireland, we'll be hearing from Treaty United manager Tommy Barrett very soon. What a first season they had as a League of Ireland uh, men's club. Their women's team, I think, has been involved in a cup for a couple of years. In Gaelic games... Cluck Balakala, I think you can say, came up with the performance of the weekend, beating Kilmacud Crokes in the AIB Leinster semi-final in Hurling on Saturday night. They will face Ballyhale Shamrocks, the legends of club hurling, in the final next weekend. Ballyhale just about overcoming St. Rhinos of Offaly yesterday in Tullamore. They got a goal late in the game to bring it to extra time and then they drove on. Owen Cody, who was named Hurler of the Year on Friday night, scored 2-3 on Sunday, so he had quite the weekend. Paul Quirk, was unlucky to be on a losing side. He is a St. Reiner's hurler. He scored four points in the game. And after their dramatic loss, after extra time in Tullamore against Shamrocks, he spoke to Casey Lawrence's Brendan Hennessy. We went to the well. We gave it, we gave it absolutely everything. Um, I mean, we were three points up. Time was up. And I remember looking up that scoreboard going, Jesus, are we going to finally get the chance to play in, in Crow Park? But typically, Kilkenny, you're never beaten. And... Uh, yeah, I think at the end, I remember TJ had the ball in his hand and I thought, oh no, it's going to be a penalty here. And I think someone just got the pull on it and went over the line. Um, and that's typically like any, you're never beaten like. Oh, and Cody, young hurler of the year, the pull on it. You know, a great experience as well playing a team like it. But as you said yourself, nearly had a three points up in at a time. Heartbreak and 15 against 14, descending off a bit of a turning point as well. Yeah, it was. Um, it was a turning point. I, I think we were coming though at the time. I think we got the game back maybe, I don't know, was it back to four points maybe yeah. at that stage? And uh, I think we were coming um, after a poor enough start and we were beginning to turn over ball, use ball really well. And um, I think that gave us another push on. Um, and especially when we went into the third water break, I think level, I think that really gave us belief to, to kick on from there. And I suppose, listen, we had a, we had a few chances to see it out and we didn't take them. And that's, that's sport, that's the way it, it falls. And um, listen, we'll... We'll sit down over the next couple of weeks. We'll we'll enjoy the Christmas. We'll we'll look back on our three in a row, and we'll we'll go to the well again next year, and hopefully build on this again. Hard luck to St. Rhinus. Bally Gunner are through to the AIB Munster Club hurling final, following their two eleven to twelve points win over Lockmore Castellani. Lockmore had John and Noel McGrath sent off, not in that order. Noel McGrath was sent off early in the game. I don't think either man should have been sent off, and it kind of spoiled the game. Bally Gunner did what they needed to do to win, but. There's still question marks on them going into the final against Kilmallock. Kilmallock overcoming Middleton. In Camogie, Schlock Neil beaten by Alert de Bala yesterday. So Alert de Bala march on to the final next weekend where they'll take on Sarsfields of Galway, the defending champions. This, by the way, is 
last season's provincial series, if that makes sense. Unlike the GA, the Camogie didn't postpone the provincial or cancel the provincial club championship. So Camogie are playing off last season's provincial club championship, if that makes sense. We'll have more on the All Ireland Club Camogie Senior Final next weekend. Next week, I should say. Right, let's get into it. Coming up, by the way, we've got Mona McSharry, who's back in the pool this week in a competitive sense. She's in the World Short Course Championship. She, of course, reached an Olympic final during the summer. And we'll talk to her in a little while. We'll also hear from Roisin Upton, the hockey player who's supporting the AIB Gold Mile. She's been to Malawi. She's seen the good work that um, Gold do. And uh, we'll chat to her a little bit later on. Obviously, she was she was in the Olympics this season with Ireland. And next year, uh, we'll be playing for Ireland in a World Cup. So she's got a big year ahead. Um, have we got anything else that I mentioned David Corkery who'll talk to us about the Heineken Champions Cup rugby yeah he's coming up as well first though it is Tommy Barrett the Treaty United manager um, they had a great season last year reached the playoffs um, shocked a lot of people in doing so they're going into their second season as a League of Ireland entity and um, I had a good long chat with Tommy about his philosophy about the club and where they want to go and what they want to do uh, but first I asked him how he was well she thanks What's it like at the moment? Are you in the thick of signing players? Are you in the thick of preparation? Are you getting a break? Are you looking ahead or are you looking back? What's what's the situation with you as Treaty United manager at the moment? Yeah, well, we don't really get a break, do we? So, uh, yeah, the players are on a bit of a break. Um, we have 16 players signed, us, so busy the last couple of weeks. Um, on the phone in particular, uh, I suppose COVID has taught us a lot now and you know, that uh, we can do a lot on the phone and, and uh, video. Obviously, we're still meeting lots of times when we can, but uh, in the main, we can get a lot done on, on the phone. You know, it's efficient that way. Um, but yeah, it's it's been busy. It's been busy, certainly, on the phone. But in the next week or two, I suppose, I'd have to get out and meet some of the lads as well. But we have 16 players signed. Um, and we're hoping to add, you know, six or seven more and... Uh, might have one or two in for pre-season to have a look at, but uh, the majority of the bulk of the squad will be signed for early January. Was it hard to convince lads to sign or the fact that Treaty had a good season last season, did that make it easier? Where where where, where does that sit? Yeah, it did. So, I, look, we're still remain an amateur next year. You know, the, the club are being um, prudent, you know, which I think is the right way to go. You know, we have to get our, our house and order off the pitch in terms of, you know, uh, building links with with universities and colleges and schools, and um, you know, uh, and I suppose building links in the community uh, first and foremost to um, you know not to be going off spend the money that we don't have. So you know, it's certainly I think the wise thing to do. Um, but you know, so it's certainly that money that lads are coming back for. Um, but the environment is positive. You know, it was a positive environment created last year, and I think you know lads. They don't want to play junior football. Like a lot of these lads probably could get more money playing junior football, but uh, and less travelling and less, less hassle. But <clears throat> they all get on. The environment is good, and I suppose that's why I was happy to sign the majority of the, the squad back. You know, how do you sell it to them if you can't give them any money? Yeah, it's just I suppose. Look, it's about it depends on what stage they are at, at their career. Like the younger players, you're saying, you know. You'd, first and foremost you do it for yourself and if you can you know down the line if you can get a um, you know a, a contract with someone else you know whether that be in the League of Ireland or elsewhere you know particularly with, with the younger players that uh, if you can get a full time contract after a couple of good seasons in, in with us uh, that's our selling point I suppose you know our good season even at the moment that's where we're at um, some of the other lads you know play at the highest level as long as you can Um particularly the older lads and I suppose that's why it's it's so important to keep it positive and and have a bit of fun with it as well. You know, it's important that we do that. You know, we I like to make a, the training sessions as uh, we set the standards as high as we can, but you know, you want the the players ha- happy in the environment as well and bouncing out of training and, uh, and and keep it as positive as possible. And I and I think, you know, a lot of the lads we did that last year and a lot of the lads are, are are uh, willing to sign you know I didn't really take much persuading at all to be honest um, so you know it's it's I'm delighted with that and it's, it's great and hopefully we can 
we can add add one or two more for the, for those reasons, you know. And is there a lot of local lads in the squad, and therefore are you kind of getting that pride of the parish thing out of the squad? Because we see it, and uh, I, I'll 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 try not to make people um, sick while I say this, but in GA, particularly in club GA, it's all you know pride of the parish stuff, and the reason you put in the effort is to give back to your club and also to get the best out of yourself. Have you kind of tapped into that? for treaty and it's something we don't really apply much to football because obviously in League of Ireland football people get paid but it sounds like it sounds like you are it sounds like like you've you've you've, you've tapped into something with these lads that it's it's about more than themselves and it's about the city the county the club etc yeah, well, the lads don't get paid so you know it's the their we have a few lads, you know, we have a few lads from Galway, obviously, um, um, but the majority of our lads, and we've, we've one or two, you know, with Dean George from Dublin and we two lads from Cork last year and it'd be pretty similar this year. So, but the majority of the squad, you know, 17, 18 of them are, are local, uh, Limerick, Clare, Tipperary, you know, and I suppose um, they have bought into that, um, you know, but first and foremost, I think you said it there first, it's, it's about pride in themselves, you know, I think that's the most important thing. Um, and play, you know, at the highest ability, or sorry, at the highest level uh, that you can play at for as long as you can. I think that's the most important thing as a footballer. And, you know, these lads have bought into that first and foremost. But then, you know, um, they bought into the what we were trying to do and, and, and the market's feel, the atmosphere created there on match day, especially when the crowd came back in. Um, you know, and I think the lads were getting a bit of recognition around the place and I think that always helps and you know I, that sense of pride is built and as you said they're playing for the parish and it's a bit parochial it can be um, and the lads the, the supporters have bought into it you know because there was a bit of a worry um, when you know Limerick FC was gone and when it was renamed and you know it had to be called a different name and it was called Tree United and there was a bit of concern around that uh you know, that people wouldn't buy into that and it was a colour change and a whole lot. So, um, but, you know, even the most uh, true blues have come over, you know, they've uh, came over to um, Treaty and I think it helped, you know, and the players, that's down to the players, you know, the players have uh, have given them hope and given them something to cheer about and, you know, we've kind of tapped into that um, and I think that's the, the, the general gist of it, uh, machine, you know. How important is it to the fans that there, there yeah. seems to be a very kind of a, a, a good business model for the club and that you seem to have a solid plan. And, you know, if I was a Treaty United fan, I wouldn't be worried, God, are these lads going to be there next week? Because actually, I know the people who are running it are running it sensibly and they're not speculating to accumulate. They're actually doing this the right way and they're building something slowly and it might take time. But you know what? I don't mind so long as I have a club to support and something to get behind. How important has that been? Yeah, it is important. I suppose the expectations have kind of gone up a bit now, you know, because we've done so well last year. But, you know, we have to be realistic. Um, and I know people are sick of me kind of dampening down things. Uh, you know, I, I think someone is saying I'm sounding a little bit like Bally Organ. Like, but, uh, uh, <laughs> you know, I, I think, uh, in fairness, you know, Ali was probably in, in, in a similar situation a few years back you know, anyway, for sure. But, you know, we... we we we're we're probably we certainly have to be prudent and we have to build it and you know we we have to remain amateur and I've no problem with that you know but there is is a plan there maybe you know we can go part time professional in in a couple of years' time and 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 slowly build it because you know we've seen it in the past with Limerick FC um, the budgets were huge when you went up in, in 2012 and, and 2000 and, um, I think it was 16 uh, and it might have lasted a year in there uh, and then came back down again because you couldn't sustain the money that we were paying so and is your come here, so, Tommy is your attitude kind of dictated by what you saw in Limerick FC at that time well, it is, Oshin, you know, but like it's also, I've been around it 20 odd years, like, like, and, you know, Limerick senior football hasn't been successful in over 40 years. You know, there's been, you know, a couple of successes 
Um, you know, obviously the ones with in the last 10 years have been the most successful in the last 40. And that was, you know, when there was money put into the club by Pat Sullivan, it was 2000. And I think, as we said, 2012, it took three years to go up with a big budget under Pat Scully, you know, and, you know, Pat did a good job there, obviously, but it was still a very big budget, uh, a playing budget. And, you know, the, the last year or two in the, in the league under um, Stuart Taylor and Martin Russell, um, might have been two or three seasons and then relegated again and then back up and then down again. So, you know, there the, the was successes before that, in, you know, um, you know, 20, 30 years ago. Um, you know, there was the, the, obviously the, the one with Sam Allardyce and the likes of that and, and Noel O'Connor won, a, won a, um, a League Cup you know, which was a was a huge success, particularly the World Bottom of the that year and, and senior football was really floundering and he kept it together and kept it going. But, you know, um there hasn't been we talk about Limerick being a, a, a soccer and a football town, but um you know it is it is very strong junior level uh for many years, but certainly senior level um the region hasn't progressed. You know, we haven't produced the senior international in, you know, forty odd years. Um so like that tells its own story when you have, you know, regularly the likes of Galway, which is similar size city, um producing players, uh international senior players, um uh, a lot of them, you know, particularly in the last number of years, you know, they've I think they had three in the last squad. So you know, um, that's that's where we're at. That's where we have to get to, and and that takes a, a lot of work. We have to build from the bottom up, um, and start producing players for the first team, uh, for three United first team first and foremost, and you know, getting it right locally, um, you know, producing players for senior football as opposed to junior football. You know, we can produce for both. You know, the the best players. Uh, Needed to be developed to play at the highest level, and then if they don't find their their way, they, they go to the next level, which is junior football. And you know, it's a high level junior football, and and like some lads might even come back in, and they might come come in later. You know, I did that myself. I, I didn't play League of Ireland until I was twenty three or twenty four, I think. You know, and I spent you know eight, eight or nine, ten seasons after that in in the in playing. So you know, I was a late developer myself. So I you know I know that, that it can happen, but in the main. Um, you know, we need to start developing players locally and, and get our get our structures right and get them in place. And and you know, but look, that needs to happen all over the country as well. We need to professionalize the industry. You know, it, it's a it's a huge issue. Um, we need to we need to put more money into the industry. We need to develop better facilities, better infrastructure. So we're not alone in trying to do that. Um, but it's certainly. You know, that's our focus. It's not on the pitch stuff and people will look at results. I know that. But you have to look at the bigger picture and look at bigger results. And the bigger results will be, you know, developing our, our facilities and developing our community stru- structures and building a strong foundation. So uh, that's certainly something that I'm passionate about and we have to get it right eventually um, because it's been 80 odd years and we, we have nothing really to show for it, you know. How important is developing a relationship with junior football clubs and making sure they know well actually you know what we can be good for you rather than we can be or rather than we will be a drain on you is that is that the key thing is that something that you are as a club working on or have worked on yeah look we you know we're, we're not going to in this locality we have, we have we can pick players as we say we pick we players from you know five of the counties in Munster last year you know we with a couple of lads from Cork and then we have Tipperary, Clare, Limerick, obviously, um, and Kerry, you know. So, you know, Waterford, we didn't extend into. Uh, but we certainly could get players from South Tip. Um, you know, we have players from South Tip and it could be on the Waterford border. So, you know, we we have a huge um, area to, to get players from. So generally, we don't um, take too many players from any one club you know, any one team. Uh, so, you know, I think it's, it's in this part of the country, it's it's probably not like Dublin where you have nine or 10 teams coming, you know, sorry, there might be a bit less than that, but there's certainly seven or eight teams coming for the, the best school by players um, and they're they're from, you know, uh, 
it might be a lot of clubs might be rated of the uh, one club like I don't know on school club like Kevin's or Cherry Orchard or someone might be rated by you know a Pats uh, and rated is the wrong word you know I think it, but players might be you know um, uh, move on you know and probably look uh, it's about playing at the next level and, and I know that can be difficult for clubs at times but it's, it should be about the players and it should be player-centred first and foremost. And if a player can play at the highest level, he should be pushed by anyone to play at it. Um, and they should be proud of that fact. Because essentially what we're trying to do, whether we realise it or not, at grassroots in League of Ireland is is to get the game better, um, get get it better locally first, then get League of Ireland better. And then uh, can we produce internationals, you know, and get the international team better? Because that's what it should be all about, and, and profession, and, and get professionals, whether that be here, England, Europe, wherever. But for me, that's what it should be about first and foremost. And after that, then obviously there's the participation side of things that's obviously very important as well. But that's what it comes down to, you know. There's only going to be so many um, high level players, top level players that you can produce. So why not everyone try to produce them? Um, um, but we have had you know positive interactions in the main with uh, with local clubs we don't have a, a major issue at all um, and is that different and, is, know, is that signal a change in the relationship because I have heard and I'm not um, speaking specifically about Limerick here but I have heard of tensions between some League of Ireland clubs and, and local junior clubs um, and, and sorry I don't mean recently I just mean over the years and I appreciate him being very vague there yeah, look, I suppose that there you know, always has been and it might be, you know, because teams like, you know, the high level junior teams, you know, as I said, I look, I, I came from one myself, you know, I, you know, I won three FEI junior cups and uh, four actually with, with um, Fairview Rangers before I went playing League of Ireland. So, you know, but like th- those types of clubs and, you know, the, the big junior clubs like Fairview and Pike and uh, New Market and Clare and uh, St. Michael's and Tipperary, that's just the ones locally. They will always have, you know, some very good players that you you will um you would be looking to get. But a lot of those players wouldn't have played school by football with those clubs. You know, like prime example, I would have taken three lads from Fairview the Rangers last year and they wouldn't have played school by football. They would have came through Limerick, they would have came through other clubs like in Newcastle West and uh uh, regional and Shannon Gold and, and they went to Limerick 19s and then they went to the like to Fairview Rangers after that and then they have they then would go back to 3D United so it's it's actually all very similar like it's just it's just the way it is you know the, the high level junior players want to play at the highest level a lot of the time and they, they perceive that as playing with a Fairview or a Newmarket or a St. Michael's or a Pike um, or, you know, the higher level junior teams. And then if they want to progress, they go on to League of Ireland. Um, and and that's the way it is a lot of the time. Um, we wouldn't, we would always encourage our lads if they, if they leave 19s to go back to where they came from, you know, go back to, the, if, they're, if they're not making it a League of Ireland with us, we'd encourage them to go to maybe someone else where they might, some other League of Ireland club if they can make it there. And if not, to go back to the junior club that they, they came from, um, because you always get you always get very good players, you know, from um, and I'll put in inverted commas here, particularly at underage, the um, the oh, well, I won't say lesser clubs, but the unknown clubs, you know, there's a lot of good players with them, and there's a lot of those unknown clubs, um, you know, they wouldn't be as as perceived as high level doing a lot of very good work in terms of coaching, you know, um, coaching underage in particular, there's a lot of the country clubs, county clubs, um, you know, doing a lot of very good high level coaching and focusing on development. Whereas um, a lot of the, the higher level junior clubs are focused on winning and, you know, it, it's very highly competitive. And it's a bit like, by, by, by a bit like League of Ireland in, in terms of, First division, you put try to put out a team that's competitive as possible, and they will get players to win games and win any way you can. So it's it's not really focused on the development side of things, um, and I think that's where we we are we fall down in this country in terms of um, competitiveness. And I don't know does that come from you know the GA parochial kind of mentality originally, um, which is fine as well. But you know, I think. 
and his GA are even changing that now at an early age of developing, you know, first and foremost. But we still have a problem in this country, as far as I can see, in terms of um, player development. It, it's winning at all costs too early. Players that want to win, whether they're eight or 80, no matter what, if they're playing a game, they'll want to win, uh, whether it's a training game or a match. And But I see a lot, a lot of coaches wanting to win more than players a lot of the time. Uh, and that's a big problem, particularly in the ages of primary development um, from, you know, six to, to 14. You know, it's 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 too early and focus solely being on winning. And and uh, like I've been at it, my have a young lad at 10 and I've been at a lot of games last year and I'm still hearing the same stuff, like get rid of it, you know. Don't, the 10-year-old? Don't. Yeah, yeah, it wow. still goes on. It still goes on. Um, like the local club are very good, but... You know, they've been playing matches and, you know, there's, there's a lot of that still goes on um, where it's, you know, it's about winning and it's about the coaches and, you know, it's not about getting the lads up to the, well, well, the highest well, level. Look, well, know. look at it this way, right? I mean, even this, the Stephen Kenny discourse over the last while, the debate has been about the style of play. And of course, because he's not getting results, people just assume that because he's trying to play football, that's not why he's getting results and they have in their head that winning football is blood and thunder, get rid of it and kind of, um, and kind of you know, the old school stuff that maybe we're trying to get away from and we're trying to evolve, particularly at underage level, particularly at under 10s. They shouldn't know what a long ball is at under 10, should they? Um, well, that's, that's only my opinion, but I'm not a qualified well, coach. Um, well, look, I don't mind them. There's, there's that wrong with a good long pass, or she, yeah. you know, it's, it's how you phrase it. You know, can you, can, like, if, if someone is pressing you and, and it's a good long pass. pass. Yeah, 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 but yeah, it's, yeah. Not, it's just that lump in it is, is, yeah. is a problem, you know, um, and it's just, we have that win at all cost mentality that we need to, we need to, um, you know, just look at, and I'm not saying to, we have our own identity in our culture, and I'm not saying just be, you know, passive and, you know, don't care about it. Of course, you care about it. The kids care anyway. But just have a look at ourselves as coaches, first and foremost, and, and what's it about? First and foremost, we should be about developing the player. And if we develop the player, particularly younger, we, we'll have a lot less hassle in, in winning games in the future and when you're older because we'll have better players. It's that simple, really. I, I, it, you got into coaching relatively early um, and it sounds like coaching is your absolute complete and total passion. Would I be right in saying that? Yeah, look, I, I, yeah, it is, you know, I, I like coaching. I like on the pitch stuff, but I like, you know, I, I like the, the human side of coaching as well. You know, it's not spoken about uh, a lot, you know, coaching management, you know, I, I, I think, you know, like I, I like to think that I can, you know, manage people and get the best out of them mentally as well as, as you know, as the the actual coaching on the pitch, um, you know, and manage the environment and, and make it a good environment. And I think that's lost a lot of the time in terms of coaching because we look at on the pitch stuff and, you know, we talk about tactics and we overdo it and, and we overcoach uh, players, I, I feel, Sometimes, um, instead of giving them the the freedom to express themselves, and and I think that's that's a that's a, a huge aspect in the, in in the modern day coaches package is you have to know when and where and and how to you know manage a session and is it about the players again? It comes down to the players. Is it about the players or is it about the coach? Because more and more I see, um, particularly at younger age groups again, you know that the 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 young Kids aren't allowed being play, allowed play. They're being overcoached, and we're we're taking the freedom and the fun out of the game. Uh, and we have to be careful uh, as coaches not to coach too much. Actually, to be quite honest, yeah, uh, and and leave leave them figure it out for themselves. And and do you ask find? I'm sorry to come across. You taught me. Do you find you know, that when a lad gets to be, maybe playing adult football or senior football, they they kind of they, they their instinct nearly is quelled, and they don't they nearly need to be told absolutely everything that they need to do on a pitch and they need to be told okay listen you're wide of the middle three and this is exactly what I need you to do or yeah or, yeah well yeah. it can happen like you know it can, it, it can happen at, at underage and at senior level um, and you know the lads have been you know told 
what to do, exactly what to do, and it can become very rigid. Um, but, you know, obviously in a defensive, in the main, defensively, I think you have to have your structures right like that. But certainly in the in the final third of the pitch, um, you have to give lads, particularly starting lads, freedom to go and express themselves. But it's, it's a difficult one because you have to build up their confidence and they're looking at you wearily sometimes like and, and thinking... Like, does he is he going to hammer me or like is he going to hammer me if I do something wrong or something wrong happens? But like, you can't do that. Like, you know, I think from a defensive point of view, yeah, something you have to have your your rigid structures at times and not be doing silly, silly stuff and cutting out mistakes. But certainly, and from an attacking point of view, you got to leave lads um, go and express themselves and and uh, get players to to do what they're good at. Really, you know. It, it reminds me of the Brian Kerr story I once heard that he gave his team talk and obviously it being a Brian Kerr team, they were very well organized and he sent the rest of the lads out and Damien Duff was just sitting there and he turned to Damien and he said, right, you ignore everything I just said, you do what you want. So he, he knew that with some lads, you had to be very um, clear in your instructions and then with other lads, you just say, right, you go and do your thing because that was getting the best out of what he had. Um, re- regards coaching, you said there that when you're, you're coaching and when you're managing, you like to get the best out of people. You like to deal with them one-on-one. You nearly see the tactics as, if not secondary, not the most important thing. It's just a part of it. How much of that comes from your actual day job, which is working in youth development? Because it sounds like there's a, it sounds like you could just as easily have been describing your day job as your, your coaching job there, your managing job there. Yeah, but it's still, it's still coaching. Like I work in youth justice, so it's coaching and mentoring. It's still very similar, and it's it's managing people and the transferable skills, you know. So you, you certainly can take um, transfer uh, um, across both jobs. Um, that's for sure. But um, I suppose the tactics, we, tactics you, you mentioned there again. No, they change. They, they change so much in the game. Like you know, people talk about four four two or four three three or three five two, but at, at any one moment in time, there could be, you know, it, it could be two four four. You know, when you have two defenders back in your chest in the game, and it could be two four four. No one talks about that. Like you know, and that could happen for a half an hour again. You know, so it's it's about players uh, giving players freedom um, to to change it themselves and see it. There's so many incidents and so many um, different scenarios in games that you can't coach them all and you have to give lads the freedom to manage the game and game management is so important and to, and to, to get players that can understand that and and actually do that on the pitch is massive. So it's about, um, I think it's about a democrat, creating a democratic environment where um, you can discuss that and uh, you know have have the discussion and have it in an open environment where where there can be questions and answers and you know obviously be respectful as you can be to each other with each other but um just have that democratic democratic process and I, and I think you know players respect that I think it takes a while to get used to because they're they're a lot of them are used to in a an authoritarian approach um, and an, an authoritative kind of leadership uh, style uh, in football um, but it, it, when I think it does work better um, when you get it right as, as long as lads don't take the, the proverbial with it you know and, and in the main they don't you know in general we, we have a, we have we look to get the best players in um, but also the best players we can but they have to be good people as well you know and you know that they don't uh, they're not going to be bad eggs inside an environment and they have to be team players and you know we we, we have the other squad last year were, were that you know and in fairness um the majority of players that I've worked with down through the years you know have been have been great you know they've they've, they've been even with Limerick FC when we were going bad in terms of there was you know the wages and stuff there was issues there around that well, obviously it's well highlighted but um you know the players were were excellent uh, in their behaviour, and in general, players um, once they get to that level uh, are generally good people. You know, um, so they, they can be they can be easy manage once they buy into it, and they, they, they know that you can build that, you can build that trust with them. 
And what are the one things for you? What, what, what do you look for in a player when you're talking to him or her <coughs> with the potential of signing? The character. Character is huge, first and foremost. You obviously have to have the positions and the ability and all those things, but you have to have, you know, you have to have uh, a character and a look for resilient people and resilient players and people of good character in general. You know, um, you know and like some lads, you know, I've signed that have had reputations, would say, but you know, reputations are easily got. And, um, you know, you have to look deeper into the person and, and see you know, what's going on for them and what's going on in their life and what experiences they have had and, you know, give them a chance. Um, and we tend to do that um, as well. And it's worked out in the main. Um, and, you know, it's, it's a hard one because, you know, it's difficult because sometimes if lads have, have, have built up a reputation for, I don't know, what a hard to manage or, or that type of stuff, um, you know, you... You have to be careful on on, on who you listen to um, and what information you, you kind of gather around them because you know you, you can only judge a person um, when you know them for for certainly over a period of time yourself. So I try not to judge people too quickly. Um, I think that's the most important thing, and, and try to build a relationship and just get a feeling in your gut what they're like. And in general, we I think we've we've gotten that right, you know. Yep. Um, tell me, what would represent a good season? next season and it kind of given the conversation we've just had that might seem like a very shallow question but it is one I'm asking all the managers that I'm talking to across this uh, pre slash close season yeah well, she, again like the expectations are going to be risen obviously because we've we've had such a uh, finishing such a high position last year and finishing fourth um, but for us we're not going to you know set goals again I think you know we Again, people are sick, blue in the face, listen to me saying game by game, but it is the way it is. It's just minute by minute. It's 15 minutes slots because so much can happen in any one week, you know, and, and people don't look at that. People just look at injured, uh, he's injured, but there's lots of other stuff can happen with players and whether that be a professional level, level or amateur level, you know, they, they're human beings as well in the locker and their lives from, you know, the day-to-day traumas that anyone, any of us can experience, you know, with, with you know, whatever in their lives, you know, family bereavement and, and uh, stresses like with work and all that kind of stuff. So, you know, we, we have to deal with that and um, throughout the, the season and we will have to do that next season as well. So, you know, it's very hard to predict where you're going to, what's a success. Success for me is, is lads trying their best in every single game um, and being competitive in every single game. And I don't think you and every training session the same and bring your best to every training session and everything what you do. And we don't look beyond that because I, I think you can't um, because when you start setting goals, you're limiting yourself, you're 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 setting you're setting limits and it, it can be negative at times in terms of like if we say, Oh sure, we're we've the lowest budget in the league, we should be finishing tenth, we should only get twenty points or fifteen points. Sure, like we're you know, we're we're taking the foot off the gas after after four weeks if we won if we had three or four games won, you know. So we have to be very careful there. So we're not going to set any limits and we're just going to, to try our best and, and do our best um and and raise standards again this year in terms of training and setting standards and and if we can do that, you know, who knows where it can take us. So I think that's the way we that's the way I like to approach things, that's the way it you know the lads have bought into so I know it's a boring answer Oshin, but that's that's uh, as far as I go with it you know No but it, it sounds like you don't just look at the results and that's a really <coughs> important thing for a League of Ireland manager and a League of Ireland club to do they kind of now look and say and I appreciate that some managers are in the position where they, they don't have to worry about what goes on around the club their sole focus is the first team and, and, and that is their job but but it sounds like you're looking and saying, well, it's not just about where we finish in the league. It's actually about how we developed as a club another season on. And I keep forgetting how young you actually are as a club and as a League of Ireland entity. Um, yeah, look, we're, we're, we're two years in as a club. We're one year in senior football. So it's, we're, we're like, like, this is a long-term project. Like, I might be here to to finish it more likely. I won't be, but, you know, it's certainly... And what are you getting out of it then, if you don't mind me asking? Because most managers, 
when they go in and take a job, it's all about what success they can achieve. But if you're kind of building it possibly for someone else, and that's the nature of football manager, manager, yeah. how are you motivating yourself? Well, you see, look, if we, and I have had this discussion with the board as well, right? And because they probably would have asked the same question, they never asked it, but I kind of said it to them myself even. But it's like, you know, for me, I've seen it for, you know, and the history of, of Treaty United is, or sorry, Olympic team of football, is 80 odd years, you know, of, ah, I won't say nomadic existence, but it's, you know, because it's, it's a small area, we played in Limerick all that time. But you haven't owned anything, you know, haven't the markets field isn't their own. Um, you know, the senior football haven't a training facility. There's no dedicated soccer, senior soccer training facility in Limerick. Um, there's no, you know, infrastructure for senior football in, in, in any way. So we have to get, uh, develop our, our facilities and get our training facilities right. And if we develop training facilities off the pitch, senior football and that's a long term thing and uh, and it's there for you know hundreds of years to come it, isn't that fantastic isn't that the best result we can get you know so um, for me you know obviously I'm I'm a, I'm a senior football supporter League of Ireland supporter in Limerick um, so obviously it's close to my heart here and that's 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 what I'm hoping to you know hoping to do and if we can get success on the pitch um as well as that, it, won't that be fantastic? The extra results then. Okay. Listen, Tommy, uh, you've been more than generous with your time. I really appreciate you taking the time to chat to us because I know you're a, a busy man with football and, of course, your day job too. Very important things that you're doing um, for the people of Limerick in both the sporting and non-sporting sense. Um, but look, the very best of luck in the next couple of weeks, planning for next season, and then the very best of luck for next season. And the first division next year, it's, a, it, it's actually a good thing rather than a bad thing. It's a bit of a shark tank, isn't it? And I'm sure your team are actually excited about being part of this because in the past, teams have, have looked at the first division and they've kind of thought, oh God, this again, let's hope we can somehow get out of this. But actually next season, the first division, there's a bit of buzz around it because you've got Cork City, you've got Galway. We saw the crowd they have for their <laughs> playoff. You've got Bray. Um, you know, you, you've, you've, it's, it's, like, it's going to be competitive. It's going to be quite exciting. Yeah, and look, and 2021 was very exciting. It was very competitive. There were some very good games. Like our, our game against UCD, the up in the UCD ball was as good as any um, game that I've seen this year. You know, it was end-to-end stuff. It was really good football. Um, you know, it finished 2-1. It could have been could have been 5-3. You know, it was, it was a really good game and there was lots of games like that in the first division. I think the, the first division gets a bit of flack because the old graveyard tag is still on it, yeah. still hanging around it. Um with some excellent young players in it. You know, we've, we're going to have three full-time teams again next year in, in Cork, Galway and Waterford. You know, you've long for coming down. Martin Russell gone in that loan. Uh, Wexford have, have been really good tail end of last year and, and Cove, you know, finished on a high as well. So, yeah, it's going to be, it's going to be really, really good, I feel. Um, again, so, uh, you know, hopefully it'll be as exciting as, as the year 2021. Yep. Cove Ramblers, I forgot to mention them. Waterford, Longford, Athlone, Wexford. I don't think yeah. I mentioned any of them. I saw a picture from inside Cove's gym the other day, and it, it looks fantastic. It's um, it's a great venue to go to. Tommy, really, there's some great work on there. Oh, she really yeah. good. You know, the, even the, the the new Astra pitch to put in and, and Cove, I suppose, you know, did something we could model ourselves on um, going forward. To, they've done some fa- fantastic work, and and same with the likes of Athlone above. You know, the, in in terms of uh, infrastructure and developing facilities, you know. A COVID, so. a, a, another club that have learned from lessons of the past. And um, Tommy, really appreciate your time. Tommy Barrett, Treaty United manager, and so much more. Thanks for joining us on the extratime.com podcast. Cheers, Oshin. Thanks. This is the extratime.com Monday podcast, and I'm delighted to be joined by former Munster and Ireland forward David Corkery. David um, is an analyst for the Evening Echo, but I'm glad that. We've been allowed to borrow him for today. David, Munster beating Wasps 35-14. I was very impressed when I heard the scoreline because I thought, well, Munster were wiped out before this game and had to play a lot of kids and Wasps are a very decent premiership team. But then you kind of poured a bit of cold water on it for me by telling me the circumstances of 
what happened. I was working at a GA match, so I knew nothing about the game. Can you tell us sure. um, about the game itself? But first of all, why maybe the field was kind of leveled up just before kickoff? Yeah, and I think, Oshin, before the game even started in the in the, in the weeks and the days and the build up towards the game as well, I think probably the media probably got a small bit um, run away with themselves in terms of you know portraying Munster as uh, the real underdogs for this game. I mean, like I'll, I'll give you some stats there. Like so, in the Munster starting fifteen, there was four hundred and seventy five international caps worth of experience. There was four British and Irish lines. There was one World Cup winner, South African, Damien Delande. And amongst the uh, starting 15, there was 1,300 combined Munster appearances, plus a whole host of Irish under-21s. And I mean, if you look at the size of the players now in the academies coming through, I mean, they don't look like, you know, under-21s or under-20s anymore. They're, they, they're fully-fledged men now coming out of school, not a mind it, under-21 level. So I think maybe there was a small bit of, um, you know, media running away with this and, as I say, portraying Munster as being the real underdogs. And you then also have to look at the Wasp side. I mean, this is not a Wasp side of old uh, that we know. Um, First of all, they had a raft of injuries coming into this game. They were also curtailed by their international players not being allowed to play because of autumn internationals that they had played with, with England in the previous weeks. Um, like They've only won three out of their nine premiership games and they're, they're, they're fighting relegation in the Gallagher Premiership. And for a Wasp side to be in that um, turmoil, is, is you know, it's not your typical Wasps, you know, fearsome side that we're all used to um, of seeing. So I think going into the game, I think there was a small bit of gamesmanship and I think Munster really played up in it as well. But also, look, in saying that, they were in turmoil. I mean, to have 15 players still in South Africa, uh, plus a host of them, again, tested positive in the week in the build-up to this game, it's not easy. It's not easy for any coach. It's not easy for any side. But, you know, Wasps were also in a bit of a hole themselves and we didn't hear much about that. And then to make matters a whole lot worse for them just before kickoff two of their backs and both their starting second rows uh, came back with positive COVID results. So they were pulled literally just before kickoff. So whatever about Munster being in turmoil, I mean, to have four players pulled from, from you just before kickoff uh, is it's crazy. It's crazy that they even fielded a team. Um, and look, so that really would have put Munster in the driving seat at that stage. And, you know, to have won with a bonus point, I think, is, is something they would have dreamt about. Um, and in fairness, for me, the, the plus <clears throat> the plus for the for Munster in this is the experience that their young guys got. I mean, it's the young players. Like there was 18-year-olds on the field at the end of the game. Um, and that's that's experience you can't buy. Uh, it's it really isn't to to play European Cup rugby at the age of 18, 19, and 20, as some of them were. Is, is something that Munster would not be able to buy or replicate in any training paddock. Um, so it's that for me is the plus. And like they didn't do bad. They didn't look out of place. So I think some of the senior boys better uh, better buck up and watch uh, what's coming up behind them. Who impressed you for Munster and what impressed you about Munster in the game? Yeah. yeah. So like if you look at the young players that came through, I mean, there, there, there was five of them really who had never played a senior game for Munster. There was uh, James French, Scott Buckley, Owen O'Connor, Daniel O'Kea and uh, Patrick Campbell. And for me, the one player that really shone out um, was Daniel O'Kea, who started at number eight. Um, he's 19 years of age. He's uh, a sprint athlete uh, in 200 and 400 metre running. Um, and the guy is is huge. He's colossal. Um, and some of the runs that he made today... You would you, you would akin to a senior player who's played maybe a good season or two of monster rugby and maybe in, in, as at in, international rugby. So, I mean, these are the players that we want coming through in monster. I mean, the power that that young player showed was immense. Scott Buckley, who got man of the match, again was all over the pitch and again did not look out of place. Um, I thought John Hodnett, um, formerly our UCC player, who has had a lot of injuries. He would have been my man of the match, I'll be honest with you. And Ty Byrne had a fantastic game as normal, poaching away. And Andrew Conway on the wing, again, was was superb. 
So um, the one worrying aspect that, that, that I think would, would come out of it was Joey Carberry was seen very gingerly leaving the field with his arm um, tucked up in his jersey, possible break, possible dislocation. Um, and that, if that is the case, then that's a big blow for Munster. Um, and I, on a personal level for, for Carberry to have picked up another injury, if it is as bad as it seems, you know, it was a huge mental blow. Like how many more injuries can that man take before he mentally breaks down? Um, and, you know, as we all know, like that part of the game is, is huge. You know, the whole mental preparation and dealing with injuries. So, <clears throat> look, it, it, it was a great day for Munster. The Carberry injury is probably the negative side of it. Um, but, you know, next week they have cast in Toman Park. A cast, again, will be a different kettle of fish completely. But the way the world is at the moment, who knows what's going to happen between now and, and, and next week. So it's one day at a time. It's one game at a time now, I think, for all the teams in every competition, yeah. be, it, be them amateurs or professional. And, um, you know, Munster did well. They did what they had to do today to leave. Uh, Coventry with a bonus point in the bag is something they could only have dreamt of, but they, they did the job in Van Gran. And I, I must mention Ian Costello as well, who who took over the coaching role from Van Grand for this for this game, um, can be extremely proud of what their players produced. Well, let's just say that Munster are not hit again with COVID during the week and that next week, everyone who wasn't available or who only came out of isolation at 12 o'clock um, last night as we speak is available yeah. and they've got all of the guys who played today and all of the guys who weren't available available for next week, they still kind of face a challenge in how to go about picking the team because I guess yeah. a lot of these guys haven't trained. The guys who played today are now kind of match fit. Um, so their their dilemma is not over. They've they, and But you can argue that it's more positive dilemma now because they know these guys can step up. Um, but it's, it's, yeah. it's an interesting situation for Munster next week, isn't it? As regards what team they go with and who they go with and you know, you can look at some of the younger players and say, well, actually, they've played and they've trained the last couple of weeks, whereas the guys who got out of isolation haven't trained a whole pile. The nature of COVID, and I don't want to second guess anyone's medical condition and I don't want to go into any individuals um, here. The nature is, is that you can be quite tired. It can affect people in different ways. So there's a, you know, Munster face a challenge regards preparing for next week, don't they? They do. I do. And again, like when you have a, a cast team, who are playing reasonably well in their top 14 competition back home in France. It's a different story. It's um, it's chalk and cheese. And, you know, whilst the guys did really, really well today, they were up against a very weakened Wasp side. Um, playing against Cast is slightly different. You know, Cast have a, probably an, end, an endless budget. Um, they have players really from all over the world. And they don't have any, like they've been to Toman Park before. They know the situation. They know what they're going to expect. Uh, they know what's coming down the road. Yeah. <clears throat> and as you said, you know, with, with, with COVID having different medical um, effects on different people, um, it is going to be very hard. But, you know, and it's great that the young players today stepped up to the plate. They, they didn't look out of place. They didn't look scared. They certainly weren't afraid to take contact. Um and it's it's a great headache for a coach to have when you have that type of competition within your squad. It spurs everybody on uh, during training to to aspire to be better players. You know, they're certainly looking over their shoulders now, uh, more of the senior players as to what's there. And Van Graan can go into the next game and the rest of the season knowing that he said that the the experience that he that these young players have picked up now will stand to them going forward. So, yeah, absolutely. It's a different story. The the one positive thing is that, you know, Munster and Thoman Park are, are a different side. They have the 16th man behind them. They always will have. But cast again, the French teams for me this year, the likes of Toulouse, Racing, uh, they look unbelievably strong. Um, and you saw some of the results they produced over the weekend. For me, um, I think if Cast uh, they're actually playing Harlequins as we speak, um, if they can get a win against Harlequins, um, they will be a force because they will want to participate in the knockout stages of the European Cup. For years, for many years, um, 
the French teams have always kind of concentrated on their top 14 simply because they get more money for winning that than they do for winning the European Cup. And as we all know, the game now today, the professional game is, is run by accountants as opposed to as opposed to coaches and clubs. Um, so historically, they would have always concentrated on winning their top 14 championship. But now there's more of an emphasis on getting into the European knockout stages. If they win against Harlequins uh, today, which they have a very good chance of doing so, yep. they will come to Toman Park fresh. They will, come, they will come hungry. If they lose against Harlequins, they will probably think their chances are done and they probably won't put out their strongest side. So a lot of it really depends on the first games for the French teams and looking at how Stade Francais, or sorry, looking at how Racing and Toulouse played um, last night in their games, they're going to be, a, the French for me, are, the, are what one of those teams are going to, are going to win. The only possible team um, who could probably, probably challenge them are Leinster. And we'll come back to Leinster in just a moment, yeah. but um, Connacht, had a good win against Stade Francais, 36-9. I'm just looking at the statistics. As you're well aware yes. at this stage, I was I was working for the uh, AIB Munster Club semi-final in Hurling, so I didn't actually see any of the rugby today. But Connacht okay. had 51% possession in that game, just 2% more possession than Stade Francais. And they actually conceded yeah. six more penalties, but still got the job done and done by a distance, 36-9. Yeah. How did they manage that? They're incredible. Like you go, you go to Connacht um, and it's it's... <laughs> This is no disrespect to anybody, but it's a horrible place to play rugby. It's cold. The wind is normally hot. To me, it seems they have their own weather pattern up there that they can actually control um, <laughs> when, when teams are uh, arriving there. But Stade Francais, I can just imagine like they're a galactico of stars. They're you know they're full of superstars. They they like playing um, French flair rugby, passing the ball, keeping it alive, and going to conduct. You don't go in there with that attitude. I mean, to me, when you look at that score I and mean, when you look at the players that Stade Francais have in their squad, to me, that signs, it, it paints a picture that they were beaten before they even arrived at the ground. It's the last place you want to go uh, when you want to play, you know, flair rugby. Connacht, in fairness, under Andy French, Andy Friend, have, um, have played a beautiful brand of rugby. They're able to mix the get down and dirty side of it with being able to move the ball. And they have, you know, the players like Alex Wooten on the wing playing for them, who's, who's you know, come through the club scene. Monster left them go, I think, was a mistake by them. They have Jack Carty pulling the strings at 10. And for me, you know, it's a close call between him and Sexton as to who's the best 10 currently in Ireland at the moment. And I think he's been hard done by in terms of the Irish selection over the last couple of games. They, they, had, they had no Bundiaki today. Um, so for them to be able to pull off that bonus point win, 36 points to nine against a star-studded Stade Francais side is just crazy. It's a, it's a fantastic achievement for them. And I think if we go back a couple of weeks as well, they beat Leinster in the RDS. You know, they haven't done that for a very, very long time. And not many teams would go to the RDS and beat Leinster. And for them to have done that uh, was a major, major achievement and a boost for them. And the confidence that would have given them going into the European Cup would have been second to none. Yeah. I'm not sure if you got to see the Ulster game against Claremont over him, but they won, yeah. which was much to the surprise of Manny. Yeah. Did, did you get to see it? I saw I saw bits and pieces of it. I was watching yeah. kind of flicking between games as they were on. But to go to Claremont again and, and come away with a victory, there isn't many teams, uh, I would say, in the world would, would go and do that. That's a real fortress of rugby. It's almost akin to Toman Park for Munster. Not many teams will go there and come out um, with anything in the bag, not a mind a win. You know, and again, you, you know, Ulster have been building for the last couple of years. Uh, they might be a small bit light in the back division in terms of getting to the knockout stages or doing well in the knockout stages of, uh, of this competition. But as I said, to go to Claremont, uh, like Claremont, like Munster have struggled down there. Leinster have struggled down there. The best teams in the world have struggled down there. Um, and to be able to physically match those guys again. And again, budgets to the French teams, they don't really have any restraints in terms of, so like that Claremont pack were absolutely colossal. And for the Ulster boys to have stood up and stood toe-to-toe and it got a bit feisty towards the end of it and during the game because Claremont didn't like what was happening. And they stood toe-to-toe and didn't take a backward step. 
Um, and you have like Stuart McCluskey there, who's a big, big man, big, powerful, big, powerful centre. Billy Burns, again, you know, I, re- I often refer to half or fly half as, as being able to pull the strings and he had a fantastic game for them. So, you know, they're a dark horse. Uh, I don't think they'll be there, they're about maybe in the last four this year, but they're certainly building um, and they seem to have a good structure behind them. They've got rid of a lot of the, a lot of the, the baggage they've been carrying over the last couple of years. So, you know, as I say, I don't think they'll be there in the semi-final situation, but, you know, next year in the year beyond, they're certainly building towards that. What about Leinster? You mentioned them already, a bonus point win against Bath. That was no real surprise. Uh, what did no. you like about what you saw from the team in blue? Well, I suppose it's easier for me to probably say what I didn't like and what they need to improve on, which was their second hand performance, their second half performance. I mean, they blitzed Bat in the first half. Like, they just literally steamrolled him. Now, again, in saying that, Bat are in serious trouble back home um, in the Gallagher Premiership. They've played nine and lost nine. And again, like that, they are not stats that you associate with any Bat team. The Bat teams of old would have been, you know, that just wouldn't have happened, you know, three, four, five years ago in any Bat side. Like, they're, they're rock bottom in their Premiership. This is now their 10th game on the bounce that they've lost. And when you see a Leinster side, you know, not their strongest side, no Sexton, missing one or two uh, of the two players in the backs as well. Um, They steamrolled Bath in the first half and then they made one or two changes. And it's like it's almost if they took their foot off the gas and there was mistakes being made, there was knock-ons. Normally, things that you don't associate Leinster rugby with, like for me, Leo Cullen and Stuart Lancaster have created a dynasty, an almost dynasty up there. Um, what they've done over the last couple of years, the squad they have, the strength and depth that they have. So, if there's anything that Leo Cullen will be looking at, it will probably be the second half performance and why they didn't continue to dominate um, as they did in the first half. Like Leinster are a ruthless side. For, for them to have done what they've done over the last couple of seasons, you know, you don't do that by being nice. And they will be worried about losing to Connacht. They will be worried about their second half performance in this game. But again, in saying that 45 points to 20 and to be disappointed, you know, that's a that's the level of standard that they demand from their players. Um, so um what I love about Leinster is the way they play the game. They can they have the powerful side, they have the the flash side, they have the flair. Um, their their bench is extremely strong. When you have players like Keen Healy and Devin Toner on the bench to come off, um, they can make a serious serious impact. Um, and I think against a team like Bath, like what I probably would have done in that scenario was probably put out a slightly weaker side. I would have held the other boys the bigger boys back in, in reserve for what's coming down the track. And um, they still would have beaten Bath. Like their third, probably their second stroke, third team would have beaten Bath just the way Bath are at the moment. And all Bath are worried about at the moment is getting off the bottom of their premiership table and remaining in the premiership. Like for Bath to move out of the premiership in the UK is serious stuff. It's like a, it would be a monumental swing in the power in English rugby. And it's not good for English rugby to have Bath languishing in that position either. So Leinster or Leinster, uh, they're an extremely strong. They've created a dynasty up there. Leo Cullen has done extremely, extremely well. And people talk about, you know, the next Irish coach, you know, whilst we have a really good coach uh, there at the moment, you know, I wouldn't be looking beyond the likes of Leo Cullen and Stuart Lancaster stepping into that role. I think they deserve it. If it does come up and when it does come up, and I suppose the other question is, would they be interested in taking it up? So Leinster or Leinster, they've, they're the kings of Ireland, whether we like it or not, whether we don't, whether we like saying it or not, um, but they are at the moment and the rest are playing second fiddles with them. Okay. David Corkery, formerly of Munster in Ireland, and of course now a rugby analyst with the Evening Echo newspaper. Thanks for joining us on the extratime.com Monday podcast. My pleasure. Well, seven Olympians among the Ireland swim team for the World Swimming Championships. Um, seven of the team that were in Tokyo will be among Swim Ireland's 11 strong team leaving for the FINA World Short Course Swimming Championships in Abu Dhabi uh, next weekend. Among them is Sligo's Mona McSharry, who, of course, 
reached an Olympic final during the summer. Mona, how are you? I'm doing great. Thank you for having me. That's absolutely my pleasure. Uh, What's life been like since the Olympics? Because I imagine, you know, that's a that's a life changing thing in every sense, both maybe as an athlete and outside of what I refer to as your day job as being an athlete. It's it's been amazing. You know, Um, I'm blessed. I think that I do train in America because I haven't, I guess, been surrounded by that change so much when I'm over there I'm kind of just one of the other swimmers which I prefer I don't I don't want to be a big Olympian Um, I just want to be me Uh, but it is really nice then to come home and get glimpses every once in a while of you know people that will spot me and notice who I am or um, even last night I was in the club with swimmers and it was really nice to just look at little kids that you know idolize you and that's it's really nice to have that much influence over a younger generation. And it must be nice as well to be the person who, through what you have done, says to these kids from this place, you can reach the very, very top. And that's that's good for you, but it's also good for the club and it's good for everyone around Sligo and, and, and Donegal and everywhere, everywhere that surrounds it. Yeah, no, I agree. I, I always lived by, you know, if you have a pool and you have water and, you know, a place to swim that's that's all you need really um and I'm glad that I can be one of you know a few like you have Ellen Walsh who trained in her home pool as well and qualified for the Olympics and I'm so glad that you know I represent a few of those that can stand there and and say that and show them kids that you know yeah what you were doing is exactly what I was doing when I was your age so you know you can be where I am and I really do love being able to show them that because I think sometimes you know they do put you up on a pedestal maybe and think that they can't reach that. But, you know, I was a little kid like that and that was my dream to go to the Olympics. And when I was younger, I mightn't have thought it was that realistic until I got older and realized it was actually something I could do. Um, So it it definitely is really nice to be in that position. At what point did you think, I can go far in this sport, I can get to the top? And how much of that kind of decision that you made to yourself or with yourself involved your family as well because if your family don't support you if your family don't get around you which obviously they did and we saw that during the summer and we heard all about it and we kind of got to know you and your family over the summer which is great you know how much of a kind of a collective decision is it oh it's it it really is a full team it's and like I will never get there no one will ever get there by themselves you have to have a team of people that also believe behind you and I guess you know I remember sitting in a little room with the Marlin Swim Club having there was a presentation someone was in talking and one of the questions was you know who wants to go to the Olympics and of course my arm as well as I think the whole room's arm shot up in the air and I was probably about 12 at that age so still kind of a dream a really big dream but probably not reality And then um, once I kind of in 2016, when I raced at the Irish trials and I was close enough to the qualification time that I realized, wow, that's that's something I'm I'm going for the next four years. I'm I'm going for Tokyo. And I think at that point it became a reality. But honestly, from the start, my whole family has been so supportive. My mom carted me up and down to Ballyshannon. early in the morning, late at night, whenever I needed it, you know, and and my dad there to support and, you know, basically everyone. And then even, you know, the Ballyshannon Leisure Centre who gave me pool time, which, you know, can be complicated for a small pool. And even Grace, my coach, um, Sean Flannery, Jim, you know, there's so many, there's such a long list of people. I could go on for ages saying all the people that helped me, but it really is. It's a whole village. It takes a village of people to support and get you there. And when you got to the Olympic final, was that a vindication of the decision you and the family made and all of the commitment that you had to give? And I don't think you could even outline now how much you had to give to get you to where you got to and continue to be. Yeah, honestly, making the final was like a bonus. It was like icing on top of the cake um, because qualifying... My goal for Tokyo 2020 um, was to qualify, to make it to the Olympics, get the experience and then, you know, take it from there, take it one step at a time. And and so once that had happened, that was like I had reached my goal. All the hard work had paid off um, and I was just so excited to go and enjoy it. And then, you know, to make it out of the heats 
uh, and then to make it into a final with you know, the best in the world. Like every country sends their best and to be able to be one of, you know, eight that made it into a final was just unbelievable, really. Um, and it was just it was so nice to to be able to experience that and, and to get there. And how does it feel to be one of the few people in Irish history to get everyone up out of their beds so early in the morning or late at night, depending on what way you look at it? Um, it was great. You know, I, I still I'm so glad that you know I have had a few people tell me that, you know, at, at such a time when there was so much stress and anxiety from, you know, COVID and the fact that it was still going on and, you know, having people tell me that it was something they look forward to waking up at, you know, three o'clock in the morning was just really nice to to hear that. And, you know, I, I still thank everyone who woke up and and watch me race and, and wanted to do that because three o'clock in the morning is that's hard to do. And I really do appreciate for, you know, a minute and yeah. seven seconds. Um, it's, it's so nice. And it, it just really warms my heart when I hear people tell me that, you know, they were up and they watched my race. You created a great debate in the country. People were saying, and I know um, my partner Aoife and I were having the discussion, do we stay up or do we set the alarm to get up? Now I stayed up, but she set the alarm to get up. Um, so thanks to you, I watched an awful lot of Netflix and an awful lot of Olympic sport. When you got to that final, was that the kind of culmination of part one of your career and now you're into part two or how do you look at it? I don't, I don't think I could even, I, I, I'd hate to put my like career up. Like, I mean, the Tokyo Olympics I've been striving for, you know, yeah, since I was, I would say 16. So from 2016 to 2021, that's kind of, that was always in the back of my mind. Um, but I've had so many smaller goals along the way. I try not to, I guess, section it up like that. I probably, it's probably part like 100 of part 200 or 250. You know, there's so many smaller little goals that I'd clump all in um, that I, I try not to look at it as, I guess, that big of a picture. Did you realize during the Olympics, what was happening at home. And when I say at home, I mean both kind of locally in Grange, where it was like this festival. I, I drove through it and there was flags up, bunting up, signs up. It was a fantastic place to be at that time. And of course, nationally as well, that was kind of replicated around the country. Did you realise that was happening and that you had all this support and that you were kind of the talking point of the country and the focus was was on you in a very positive way? I, I don't think I realized how much it was until I came back and had people tell me, you know, from their perspective from being here. Um, I did to an extent, of course, and I wasn't, I would try not to be super clued in on social media or any of that. I had, thankfully, I had my friends kind of doing that side of it. Um, I allowed myself to see as much as I wanted to see and then would cut it off. Um, but I think I really didn't realize, you know, because I've, I think I've swam, you know, a good few races in my life and made a couple of finals. And I think in my head, it was just another race, another semifinal, another final. It didn't really dawn on me that it was the Olympics, I think, while I was in the zone, because you have so much, you know, I'm kind of just focused on my routine and everything that I normally do at a competition that it kind of just falls into regular stuff. But listening to people then, you know, say that, yeah, there was such a positivity around it and everyone was so excited and I had so many people wanting to watch it. Even people that never met me was was really nice to hear. Um, and I think it, it's really nice even still now to hear about it because, you know, you're still meeting people and they're still telling you that they love to watch the race. So you're off now to the FINA World Short Course Championships in Abu Dhabi. Um, it's a 25 metre pool this time or a 25 metre course as opposed to a 50 metre. Uh, how different... For you is that or how different or otherwise is that for you I mean I because of the way I um I'm now c competing collegiately over in America too I do swim a lot of short course yards which is not it's even shorter than short course meters but I do get a good bit of practice in kind of doing training with a lot more turns than long course so I, th I think that will definitely help me but it is it's completely for me anyway, it is, it's completely different. It's a much faster paced race than, than a long course race would be. Um, but a lot more exciting too. You know, you're bouncing over and back in a little 25 meter pool. It's great. Um, I love fast turns and I love being able to, you know, use my underwaters and 
it's it's nice to kind of switch it up from long course because you know long course has such with the olympics being long course and everything sometimes i think it can be a lot harder to to take maybe races that aren't hundred percent long course where short course, you kind of just get out there and race. And I really do love that. And, you know, my whole life I was training in a, a 25 meter pool, uh, even as a kid. So it's kind of what I'm more familiar with, I would say. And do you have specific aims and goals going into this or how does it work for you? Um, my goals are going to be kind of see where I am. You know, I, I do want to make, I want to make it out of the, the heats in the 50, 100 and 200 breaststroke um and kind of just see how it goes from there taking it one step at a time but you know I haven't raced short course meters in quite a while due to COVID so um of course I'd love to you know swim faster than all my PBs uh, and just put together some really good races it's a it's a weird we're kind of getting back used to maybe competing in December it's it's strange so um I'm I'm excited to just kind of go out there and see what happens mainly just race just get my hands on the wall first And has the Olympics kind of changed your attitude? Are you less nervous going into events now because, well, you've done it on the biggest stage, so you know you can do it. And that maybe gives you a kind of a, you know, a confidence in the back of your mind. It definitely depends on the day. You know, I have, like any athlete, I have good days and bad days. Um, I think it's, it's definitely shown me a more fun side to racing. I really tried to kind of have fun at the Olympics and I'm sure with the interviews after, as you can see, I was kind of always beaming and even before my race, always smiling and, you know, trying to just soak it all in. And I think I'm, I'm going to bring that to everything I do, but you know, you will have days where you have doubts and worries and yeah, I, I do hope that if I can think back on the Olympics, that it will, you know, help me realize that, you know, I, I can do it. And even if I don't do it, it's not the end of the world. You're going to have bad races as well as good races. They can't all be good. Um, and I think, you know, trying to just have a more positive outlook in general and just being able to to work through the maybe not so good races. I think that's like the Olympics has kind of will help me do that. And will you get back to Sligo for Christmas after all of, after all of this is over? Yes, I will. I will be back here after the we're flying home on the 22nd. So I will be at home for Christmas, which is amazing. I had to stay in America last year, which was fine. Um, but I really, I really was missing home this semester specifically, especially with such a quick turnaround after the Olympics. So I am really excited to just be at home, do the Christmas swim, decorate the tree, all the fun stuff. And will you relax? Can you relax? Do you find it hard to relax? Um, I do find it, I do like to sit down in the evenings and stuff, but, um, I would never want to do nothing. You know, I do like to do stuff, not necessarily have to be swimming, but, you know, circuit classes or go out for a walk or go to the beach, something. I, I am quite a, an active person in general. I do like to do stuff. So I think I'll always be that way. Um, yeah. yeah. And and are your family as much crack at Christmas as they are while watching you in the Olympics? Because, again, I think we all feel we know your family now, given the insight. We literally got inside their home um, during the Olympics, during the races. Oh yeah. They're, they're always good fun. Um, I, I really do love my family. I'm, I'm so glad that I get to spend, you know, this time with them and yes, we will be having a lot of fun at Christmas, a lot of good food and a lot of fun. Okay. Well, well, we, as an Irish public took them for the Olympics for Christmas, we're going to give them back to you, uh, Mona, Mona McSharry. Thanks very much for joining us. Congratulations on on a, on a great year in 2021. And of course it's not over yet because next weekend you've got the FINA world championships at the very best of luck to you and the rest of the Irish team. Thank you so much. Mona McSharry speaking ahead of the World Short Course Championships in Abu Dhabi this weekend coming. This is the ExtraTime.com Monday podcast still to come. Tom O'Connor will round up how the Irish did in the UK. But first, let's talk to Roisin Upton of the Irish hockey team. Of course, they played in the Olympics last summer. They won a World Silver Medal a couple of years ago, and they're back in a World Cup next year. So she's got a busy time coming up. Before all that, though, She's helping launch the AIB Goal Mile. They're asking you to move 2,000 steps between now and Christmas and you can raise funds for some vital causes. To find out more, go to www.goalmile.org. Uh, Roisin, before we talk about hockey, um, you've seen the good work that Goal do and you've seen how important these funds are and, and how they're used. 
Yeah, I've been lucky to be an ambassador for Goal since 2018. And I've seen firsthand the work that they do. I travelled to Malawi uh, with Jenny Murphy and Sinead Ahern back in 2019. And we got to see the programmes that they implement to educate people and um, I suppose to make their lives more sustainable and to make them more independent. And it was just, it was fantastic. So this year, like every year, you know, it's a well-established Christmas tradition, the Gold Mile. It's just 2,000 steps and, um, you know, it's happening all over the country. There's so many different locations. You can go on to goalglobal.org to check out the different locations that it's happening in and the different dates and the times and everything. And as I said, 2,000 steps, nothing compared to what what people in Haiti, people in Africa walk every day to get to school or, or to get water. Yourself and Luke Fitzgerald have been encouraging people to do the Gold Mile this week. And, and obviously, and I guess it's the same with Luke, when you start playing sport, you start playing it because you like to play sport. But maybe when you get to a certain stage in life, you realize, well, actually, sport is as much about helping others and community as it is as a professional sports person, as you are and an elite sports person, as you are, as much as it is about qualifying for Olympics and World Cups and all that. It can, it like, I mean, sport is, is, is unbelievably important in that sense, isn't it? It is. And I think, you know, I think the last couple of weeks has given me a chance to reflect on how how something like the Olympics, which is has been my absolutely everything for the past, you know, nearly my whole life, about how it's almost over in the blink of an eye. It's it's three incredible weeks, a huge high, but you know, it's such a small part of your life in the grand scheme of things. Um and really it's been part of a team. It's it's been a, a global citizen. You know, I'm so grateful to all the opportunities that I've had through sport. And I suppose you see in Malawi, they don't even have local sports teams. You know, some of them don't have the opportunities to play for Malawi, to play for their country. They don't even, you know, they might not even know what an Olympics is. Um, it's just a world apart. So these funds are so vital um, in, in supporting these people just in their everyday lives. And I guess it's a reminder to us as well you know the, the 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 i suppose the the aim of some parents when they're putting kids into sport or the aim of some people when they themselves go and play a sport is to try and be the best that they can be and people dream of their kids going on to win winning all irelands and reaching olympics or you know um playing in the premier league but actually the the key thing in, in sport is the lessons you learn in life and judging from what you were saying there about malawi we are so lucky to have it in this country that in pretty much every parish in the country you can play some kind of sport Absolutely. You know, it, it's cliche, but it, it, sport is a gift. And as you said, we play a heck of a lot of sport here in Ireland. We're competing at a high level across so many sports. But more than that, um, you know, it's just the social level, um, the impact that it has even on our daily lives of being social, whether it's going to a class or whether it's going playing five side. Sport is, is fantastic. And that's, you know, originally why goal was set up, um, because sport is uh you know universal language it brings us all together talk to me about your own year in sport reaching the olympics i imagine was the high point or playing in the olympics was the high point yeah definitely um after the stress of the last two years the uncertainty the rumors it was such a relief um to step onto the pitch for the first for the first game even once we got to japan you know you're still two weeks out from playing in an olympics and you're trying to look after yourself from a COVID point of view. You're trying to stay injury free. Um, obviously, we had selection before that. So there, there were so many different stresses. Um, so I'm just so relieved that that they went ahead. And was the Olympics everything that you thought it would be? Or, or what kind of experience was it? Try and give us an insight into what it was like to be in Japan and in Tokyo. Um, you know, I, I think being part of a team is so special. Um, and I'll harp on about it. But when you're sharing that experience with other people, um, you know, I think that's what makes it the most special thing. And we were so excited from the moment we met up in Dublin airport, we got to our holding camp in Iwate in the North of Japan. We came down, made it into the Olympic village. Everything was just so exciting. We had so much crack, even though there were some restrictions and there was less things to do in the village than what would a normal Olympics would apparently be. Um, you know, we didn't really know the difference because we'd never been to an Olympics before. So we woke up every morning singing out of our balconies and uh, we just had great fun. Um, I suppose retrospectively, looking back now, you can't help but wonder how different it would have been had the stadiums been full and had there been the crowds of people um walking the streets of Tokyo had we gotten to see even more um 
more sports ourselves once uh, once we were knocked out of the competition. We were lucky we got to see a couple of different sports. We saw the likes of Kelly Harrington compete, but just all those things, you know, having our families there would have been would have been so special. So definitely disappointment that they missed out on it. But overall, it was an incredible experience. It's been, a, you know, such a big year for you, both, I suppose, on the pitch and off the pitch. You're now living in Dublin. You're now working in Dublin. How are you finding that? Yeah, it's been a big change. I never thought I'd move up to the big smoke, but um, I'm actually really enjoying it. Um, if I had stayed in Limerick, I would have got back into teaching and it would have been that bit more difficult to continue playing uh, with all the training up in Dublin. So I'm up here for the year teaching and, and playing um, and continuing playing. So, yeah, I'm, I'm having a great time. I'm living at one of the girls, Sarah Hawkshaw on the squad as well so we're enjoying some downtime now back sense of real life working again um but looking forward to regroup with all the with all the team in January we used to have a teacher when I was in school who was a big GA star and anytime we wanted to distract him from actually doing work with us we'd ask him about GA we would talk about his own matches are your students are they after copying onto that are, are they trying to distract you by asking you all about hockey and playing and all that um some of the older ones all right in fifth and sixth class you know came to me looking to sign sticks and bags uh which is a bit unusual in school environment getting a teacher to sign those so um no it, it is great that they're aware that we have an Irish women's hockey team people didn't know back in 2018 that we had an Irish women's hockey team that we were gone to a world cup so you know we've come a long way in the past three years genuinely you know and, and all jokes aside that really is important isn't it that that's a that's a key thing it is, of course. And, you know, when I think when you look at all all female athletes in Ireland or female sports in the last two years, three years, uh, you know, I grew up with Emer Creek and the Irish hockey captain at the time as one of my only female role models. There just weren't that many out there. Whereas now you have an array of female athletes, you know, whether it's team sports or individual sports, whether it's uh, horse riding boxing it doesn't matter soccer rugby there's there's so many opportunities out there now that girls can see um, and young boys can look up to and see as well that you know it's just, it's just as normal um, for girls to be playing at a high sport and I've really really enjoyed it I've I went you know the time with the time off I went um, out to Tala to see the girls play against Georgia two weeks ago and it, it was phenomenal to feel the atmosphere in the crowd um, did a huge win on the day so there's great excitement um, and, and hopefully they can you know kick on and qualify for a World Cup as well Just before I let you go Roisin if we're having this conversation this day next year what will you hope to be telling me about 2022 what would be a good 2022? Uh, hopefully to you know build on the Olympics so that would be a step further than our pool so getting to a quarter final at a World Cup um, to have re-qualified I suppose to have sealed our spot in August with our home competition so to have cemented our place in the European A division for the following year with that competition and then next December it's all to play for with um, the Pro League 2 so it's the second division of a Nations Cup or a Pro League um, and that's on next December so hopefully we'll we'll get a good result out of that because ranking points are going to be key over the next two years um, to qualify for, for Paris Olympics. And it sounds like there's going to be a lot of big games across the year next year. And this might seem like a silly question. So tell me if it is. But considering all the world and all sports stop for a while, do you appreciate playing games even more than you already did now, if that was possible? Oh, yeah, of course. I think, you know, last year we were in a fortunate position where we were still able to train. Um Consider, being considered elite athletes uh, we were allowed we were afforded that opportunity but nothing beats going out actually playing games you know um that sense of competition getting to travel abroad with Ireland or even playing you know locally on a Saturday with Catholic Institute doesn't matter what it is and I think everybody missed sport over the last two years so it's great that it's been back um over the last six months. Roisin Upton of the Irish hockey team thank you very much for joining us on the extratime.com Monday podcast. She's supporting the AIB Goal Mile. You can find out more by going to www.goalmile.org. That's almost it for this podcast. Before we go, though, let's get a roundup of how the Irish did in the UK football wise with extratime.com's Tom O'Connor. In the Women's Super League, Grace Maloney's Reading side kept a clean sheet as they beat Chelsea 1 0. Louise Quinn Scored for Birmingham, but they lost 3-2 to Man City. England's recent record-breaking goal scorer, Ellen White, scored past Ireland's Mary Hurhan in the 89th minute to secure victory for the Citizens. Megan Campbell made her competitive Liverpool debut as they won 4-0 away at Burnley in the Women's FA Cup. 
Skipper Nee Fahey scoring the third in their comprehensive victory. Ireland men's national team skipper Seamus Coleman was involved in Solomon Rondon's first league goal for Everton, but they unfortunately slipped to a 3-1 defeat to Crystal Palace. In the championship, Robbie Brady made his championship debut for Bournemouth, but they lost 2-0 to Dara Lenehan's Blackburn. Blackburn now are in fourth, one point behind third place West Brom, for whom Callum Robinson scored the winner at the weekend, his first goal in the league since August. Mark McGuinness, who's now scored two goals in successive weekends from centre-half, netted in the last minute to secure an equaliser in Cardiff's 2-2 draw against Birmingham. Skipper Alan Brown found the net for Preston as they beat Barnsley 2-1, while ex-Ireland under-19 cap Aaron Cashin made his league debut for Derby as a 90th minute substitute in their win over Blackpool. In the Scottish Premier League, it was a 1-1 draw as St Mirren faced Hibernian and an Irish goal scorer for St Mirren in the form of Joe Shocknessy. In the Scottish Championship, we saw another Irish goal scorer who has not scored for a long time in the shape of Mark Connolly, the clonest man on loan at Dunfermline from Dundee United netting against Queen of the South. And in League One, in, in the back down in England again, Gavin Bazunu kept yet another clean sheet as Portsmouth won 2-0 at Morecambe. And there is a save of his going viral on social media. It's well worth a, a look if you get a chance. And thus ends the roundup for this weekend. Thanks very much for that, Tom. That's it for the ExtraTime.com Monday podcast. Remember, you can talk to me on Twitter, at Oshin Langan, or you can get Extra Time itself on at Extra Time News. Have a good week. Enjoy the Christmas shopping. And um, just finally, the very best of luck to Conan Byrne and Brendan Clark. If you're listening to this on Monday, they're finishing off their adventure around the League of Ireland grounds today for a Make-A-Wish the Make-A-Wish Foundation, I should say, and um, you can donate still and even in the next couple of days and weeks um, after the event. So please do, just Google Make-A-Wish and you'll be able to find all the detail you need. That's it from us. We'll talk to you soon. Take care. Bye-bye.